Today we're back into our series called Burnt, Reasons People Leave the Church and Even Leave the Faith. Uh, it was supposed to be Harold preaching today, <clears throat> and uh, he has a, uh, a very significant sermon to give on this, uh, but because his wife Ruth got COVID during the week, they're isolating at the moment. Uh, so he is going to be talking, not next week, because we've got Dan Patterson coming down from Queensland to preach next week. Uh, from Questioning Christianity, great apologist, maybe one of the better apologists in, in Australia at the moment. Um, good bloke too. He's going to preach next week. So possibly the week after we'll have Harold preach on um, people who would say, I love Jesus, but not the church. And in particular, going to be looking at people who have had um, significantly difficult, uh, all the way to abusive experiences in churches. And uh, he, he has been in a church like that. I don't want to like preempt his sermon, um, but I, I think that's going to be a very impacting sermon for, for us. Even if you've never experienced that, if you've had any, only had really good uh, experiences in a Christian community, and I, I'm not sure how that's possible, but, but if, they, if that is possible, um, it'll at least help equip you to be able to love and care for others, understand perhaps more uh, of other people's experiences who, for some people, man, uh, the church, if we can just call it that, has been a, um, a horrific place where the, the person and work of Jesus has not been represented at all, uh, let alone well. So um, that was going to be today, not today anymore. Today, we're going to be looking at uh, people who say something to the effect of God promised and didn't deliver, so I'm out. So God, God told me this thing, <clears throat> or promised me this thing, I did not get that thing, so I'm out. Uh, and variations on that, like we're going like to look at this morning. I do want to say, uh, through, throughout this series, even like I just mentioned about people who've, been, who've suffered uh, for some really uh, horrific abuse in the church by people who claim the name of Jesus, uh, there are legitimate and sometimes very, very good reasons to leave a church. Um, there are sometimes very good reasons to run hard from uh, a, a God or gospel that is not the God or gospel of creation, history, and the Bible. We're going to be looking at a little bit of that today. So I'm in no means trying to say today that the people who have walked away from the faith actually didn't know God or the gospel or the scriptures at all. I'm not trying to you know, build up some sort of... Um, you know, a, a case that there is no good reason to leave a church and that people, the only reason someone would walk away from the faith is that they didn't really understand uh, the gospel in the first place. Um, but that is a reason that some people walk away from the faith and certainly leave church. They've misunderstood the promises of God or they've taken things as promises from God, things that he has never said. So we're going to be looking at some of those more popular ones today um, because either God has promised them something that they haven't got or uh, because they believed something about God that wasn't true. So they've walked away from a God who doesn't exist. That's what we're going to be looking at today. So let's pray and, uh, and ask God to help us. Father, again, we need your help. Every time we open Scripture, Father, we need your help because... We know that you're speaking to us by your words, by your scriptures. And so help us to have open hearts and minds to your spirit as you speak to us today. As we uh, open up your scriptures and again open up our lives to what you'd have for us. We don't want to be deceived. We don't want to be foolish or naive. We want to be people of the truth. Uh, to know you how you really are. And so um, we, we really, really need your help because we can't figure that out for ourselves. We need you to show us. So please, Lord, give us discernment. Help us to <clears throat> be diligent and disciplined in checking everything that we hear and everything that we believe um, through the lens of your scriptures. And ultimately, help us to know you as you are in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've heard this uh, basically said in these kinds of ways. Uh, God told me either by just my own thinking or maybe a pastor or some sort of 
Bible teacher told me or I felt the Holy Spirit say or I've read by my own interpretation of Scripture that if I gave my heart to Jesus, my life would all of a sudden get better, materially better, healthier. I'd receive healing for this particular kind of sickness or I'd walk in victory over every circumstance in my life or the God wants me to be prosperous and healthy. I've heard every like iteration and nuances in between all of those from people who um, are well-meaning, people who actually can be full of faith, but what they have faith in, I, I want to put to you, is not the God of the Bible or the gospel that we put our hope in. Or it's the inverse. They say, well, this bad thing happened to me or this good thing that I hoped for has not happened yet. And if God doesn't give me that thing that I want, a husband, a wife, a promotion, a job, uh, you know, some, some release from this sickness or, or mental health, uh, or whatever it is, insert your good thing. Like we could even say all of those things could be objectively good things. If God doesn't give me that objectively good thing, obviously if he loved me, this is an objectively good thing, he would give me that thing, therefore because I don't have that thing, God has abandoned me or doesn't love me or doesn't exist. So I'm out. Or I'm going to go get it on my own. Like stu stuff, stuff you, uh, I can, if I just go and do it myself and live life my own way, I reckon I can probably achieve that thing. Again, all, all different kinds of variations on these. And these are all really uh, variations on the theme of the prosperity gospel or the health wealth gospel. It's wreaked havoc in the global church uh, over the last... I mean, at least 50 years, certainly over the last 30 years, uh, seeped its way into even mainstream, even mainline evangelical churches, uh, into the teaching of otherwise uh, good teachers who may not be like f full on with their prosperity doctrine, and yet the, the ends of the tentacles of this um, false gospel are wide-reaching in the global church. And it's resulted in people rejecting Jesus and rejecting the gospel because they're rejecting a Jesus that doesn't exist and a gospel that has no power to save. And so I know uh, many people uh, who have rejected this gospel and walked away from their faith completely. And every time in catching up with people like this, some I know very well, some I, I know just you know, casually. Um, almost invariably, it ends up with me saying something like, I would also reject that God, and I also reject that gospel. Like We, we, are, we have a similar rejection of that gospel. Uh, for me, my faith is not in a gospel like that, which has no power, and my faith is not in a God like that, who is more like Santa Claus than the God of history and the God of the Bible. Uh, there was a survey of uh, millennials a couple of years back found that 80% of millennials said their major life goal, number one life goal, was to get rich. Four in five millennials said their number one goal in life to get rich and uh, about half of them said that another major goal, top five, was in some way to become famous or well-known. And so uh, what we see in the prosperity gospel is that the prosperity gospel totally buys into the spirit of the age, which is you should be well thought of, you should be happy, you should be healthy, and you should be wealthy. And then when people hear that Christians are saying God also wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and happy, even if they're not people of faith, they just have this you know, they, they hear it in, um, in, uh, in movies or media or things like this. This is what the Christians say. <clears throat> then their vague idea about God is, well, God is a God of love. These things are objectively good. Everybody else seems to want them. Therefore, God also wants me to have them. Therefore, they are worthwhile goals for me. And if I don't get them, again, God doesn't exist. God doesn't have the power. God doesn't love me. The false gospel 
of the prosperity gospel just buys right into the major idol of the majority of people in Australia, which is health and wealth. It's ease, it's comfort. I spoke to a pastor last night uh, at a wedding and he was saying that a young couple in his church who, um, I, I know these guys, I love them. He said, oh, they've recently, they called a few weeks ago and said, oh, we, we're not coming to church anymore um, because we're both running small businesses and we just want to make as much money as we can and someday church gatherings get in the way of that goal. I bought into the, they still believe in God and God wants them to be materially wealthy and uh, comfortable. Therefore, that worthwhile goal for them trumps clear instructions in Scripture to not neglect to gather. It's preaching you've probably heard, if not directly, elements of, because again, it has become endemic, infiltrated, uh, I'll say even most of the Western church, elements of this. Some variation on God wants believers to be physically healthy all the time, materially wealthy, personally, circumstantially happy, uh, and it's available to you if you just have enough faith. I was talking to a pastor during the week from a, from a church outside our kind of tribe, if you like, and he was saying, wait a second, so you, are you trying to tell me that you don't believe that total and permanent present healing right now is, is um, uh, guaranteed in the atonement? And I said, that's right, because otherwise, why have so many Christians died of so many illnesses and uh, disease and sicknesses and, uh, and war and otherwise over the last 2,000 years? Uh, can we, can, we can't say that because Jesus died for our sin that he also died for us to be materially healthy and wealthy all the time. And he, this guy, again, just he's like blowing his mind that somebody would believe this because... This kind of thinking has become so endemic in the church. Paul writes to the Galatians, and he says this, Galatians 1, I am astonished, astounded, flabbergasted that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed, as we've said before, and so I now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Now the false gospel that Paul's talking about is a different false gospel to the one I'm talking about, but the truth remains that <clears throat> our hearts love to run after things that are contrary to the gospel of Jesus. The gospel of Jesus is a difficult gospel to receive. We, we are so uh, dead in our sin that we need a third party, a third party agent to come and bring us back to life. We have nothing in us that we can go to God and say, see, you should be pleased with me, but because of his great love for us, sent his own son to die a death we deserve, take our sin upon himself and impute or gift to us his own righteousness so that the God who loves us in his holiness and justice can have relationship with us. That is the inverse of you're special. Of course God loves you. God wants you to be, have everything in, in this life that you want. In fact, Go to God to get the thing that you want. That is the prosperity gospel. You have things that you want. You want material health, material wealth, comfort in life, ease in life, promotion, and to be well thought of by others. So that's what you want. Go to God slash Father Christmas to go and get what you want. That is not the gospel. The gospel is you are dead in your sin, unable to reach up to God at all. And God in his love steps down and actually dies so that you can live. And then God becomes the goal. Not the promotion, not the husband or the wife 
or the kids or the house or the job or the health. I'm not saying any of those things are bad things. I'm saying all those things are very good things and very bad gods. How do you sniff out a false gospel? Well, firstly, uh, three, three things. A false gospel will point to something other than Jesus. So again, a false gospel might use Jesus as a means of getting that thing. So again, the, the thing is a spouse. Or the thing is a successful career or business or whatever it is, health. And I can go to Jesus to get my goal. Uh, firstly, a false gospel will point to something other than Jesus. The thing, Jesus gets you the thing, but Jesus is not the goal in a false gospel. Uh, secondly, they appeal to our flesh. So what do you already want? God wants to give you that thing. You don't need to change. God will change your circumstances to conform to your prior wants. That's a false gospel. And thirdly, false gospels will not, you won't find it in Scripture, or you can find a few passages out of context or multiple passages contorted to make it say what you want it to say. Three characteristics of a false gospel. So prosperity gospel answers, answers these things. Uh, firstly, you're saved by faith, evidenced in health and wealth, saved from poverty and financial heartache, saved to enjoy financial abundance and comfort in this life. So, so really... God is almost not even in this picture. Faith is the, is the uh, thing that determines whether or not you get something, not God. God is not the thing that you get. There's no enjoyment or worship of God in here. Uh, there's getting a thing and having faith that you can get the thing. It's basically the secret. It's calling it out to the universe but instead of the universe, you're just replacing that universe with God or the Holy Spirit to get the thing that you actually most want. The truth is, and I'll show you from Scripture, uh, Jesus does not ever promise blessing and luxury in this life. He promises, he promises us blessing and hardship, actually. That's the promise. <clears throat> uh, I knew, I know someone who at one stage said, uh, God told me I'm going to marry this particular man. Uh, well, have you ever met that guy? No. Uh, is there any possibility of you meeting this person? No, but I, I believe, God has downloaded this to me. I believe it. Uh, this person, the other person became engaged, a very famous person. Uh, and this person, uh, I talked to the, you know, the person who told me, that I, I have this promise, I'm clinging to this promise. Uh, what do you think about the fact that he's now engaged uh, to somebody else and you still haven't met him? Uh, well, no, I've got this promise. And when that promise didn't come to pass, this person was crushed. Another person who <coughs> tragically... Uh, she had a terminal illness, or it didn't need to be terminal, became terminal. And she believed, well, I'm not going to have any medical intervention because God has promised me he's going to heal me. Promised. Like, how did he, how did he promise you this? I just, I just know it. I feel it. I'm, I've been told by the Spirit. He's pro promised. And so she wouldn't let anyone even mention her sickness, uh, wouldn't let people even really pray for her, to be healed, any of those kinds of things, because God had somehow promised this thing. So she was clinging to a promise that God had never made, and tragically she died. Because she's believing a false gospel. The gospel of grace is uh, these three things. Saved by grace through faith in the wrath-absorbing death of Jesus. Saved from a holy God, from his righteous wrath. Saved to peace with God, save to holiness, to restored relationship with him and with each other, save to God's community, his family, who treasure Christ and enjoy him above everything in this world and the next. Um, old mate uh, John Piper, he said, Limit, uh, lining your pockets with gold won't make people think that your God is good, it'll make them think that your God is gold. 
So again, speaking with my mate during the week from a totally different tribe, saying, well, how are people supposed to trust in God as you proclaim him if you share your weaknesses? How they get, if, you, if you show that your life isn't awesome, like we're supposed to be walking in victory, right? How are people supposed to trust? How is that attractive to people? If you, if you show your weakness, if you're not driving a very nice car, if you're not living in a very nice house, if you haven't overcome, and if you're not living life victoriously, how is that supposed to be attractive to people? And I said to him, well, like, let's do a little bit of work. Talk to me about your friends who you know for sure. Uh, what's, what does their life look like on stage or in front of other people? What does their life look like behind stage? And he said, well, on stage, looks awesome. Behind stage, hiding struggles. Hiding sin that is crushing them into the ground. Hiding gargantuan debt. Hiding mental health problems because, well, not just because, but complicated by the fact that they're trying to project an image of having everything together and they are killing themselves trying to portray a victorious life because that's what the prosperity gospel demands of them. God hasn't given it to them, but God is supposed to give, the, give me these things. Therefore, I have to manufacture a false witness of these things so that other people can see how good my God is so that they would want him as well and can join me on this debt-ridden, uh, mental health-crushing, emotionally stunting, um, you know, death trajectory. It's a, it's, a, it's a tragedy, actually. Uh, Piper again, he says, material prosperity can't be a proof of God's favor. doesn't mean God doesn't love you if you're materially wealthy. But it can't be a proof that he does because this is what the devil promises people who worship him. So that can't be the thing. Material blessing, health. Jesus says his followers are blessed when they're poor, blessed when they're hungry, blessed when they're weeping, blessed when they're hated, blessed when they're excluded, blessed when they're insulted, blessed when they're rejected. Jesus said you're blessed when you are those things. We spent like three months looking at this in the Sermon on the Mount just a couple of months ago. It's the antithesis of the prosperity gospel. David Platt, he said, uh, a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves, that's the prosperity gospel, when the central message of Christianity is actually about abandoning ourselves. Makes no sense in light of places like James 2, where he says, uh, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, where he said to the poor man, you over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved Brothers, has God not chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he, has, which he has promised to those who love him? So if the prosperous man had wealth due to his great faith, then this would be a mark of the blessing of God. Then we would be instructed by James not, not to treat him the same as the poor man, but to look up to him. Look how much God has blessed this guy. Obviously, he's doing something right. Obviously, he is walking with the Lord. Obviously, because you can tell by his material blessing. Conversely, this guy, the poor guy, obviously, he's lacking God's blessing. Obviously, uh, we can <clears throat> treat him poorly because it's his own fault. It's his lack of faith that's put him in this position. That's the opposite of what the Spirit tells us through James in his writing here. He says, no, no, no. We don't, we don't make judgments based on these things. He says here what true riches are, belonging to the king. Faith. Not faith that God owes us something and will give us a thing we most want, but faith that has God as the thing we most want. This is one of the worst parts of this, this 
false gospel doesn't point to Jesus and the freedom found in him. It points to the idols of wealth and comfort, excess, things like this. Uh, Steve Jennings, he says, rather than offering the healing salve of the gospel to hurting people, it rubs salt in wounds, does this false gospel and others like it. Rather than proclaiming the good news of favor with God on the basis of Jesus' perfect life and atoning death, it condemns those who are suffering. It condemns those who are sick. It condemns those who are dying. It condemns those who are poor. It condemns those who can't pull themselves up by their bootstraps. That's a false, crushing, demonic gospel. If blessing looks like material wealth and health, then if you don't have it, you've got to pretend to have it, again, or go into debt to pretend that you have it, so you can prove your righteousness before others. Otherwise, it's so starkly materially on display how much God favors you in this false and crushing system. It means you cannot share your burdens. It means you can't share your weaknesses. And you know, Paul writes in Galatians later on, he says uh, in chapter six, um, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You cannot fulfill the law of Christ if you don't share your burdens and have those burdens borne by others or if others don't share their burdens with you and you bear their burdens. We cannot fulfill the law of Christ unless we are open with our weaknesses. I know. Uh, if if our blessing will have material health and wealth, then you must live in denial that you're sick. Or you, I, oh man, I have a good friend um, who a few years ago was told <coughs> by, some, by some proponent of this kind of gospel uh, if you just had enough faith, then you're stillborn, might still be alive. Or, because it was at, like, at the, like on the day of birth, if you just had enough faith, you could raise them up from the dead now. That's the kind of uh, thinking that comes with this kind of faith, uh, this kind of uh, gospel forces people to twist scripture. Again, if you only had enough faith, you'd be healthy. If you only had enough faith, if you only believed, uh, had some sort of magical force of faith, then you could be materially successful financially. But you know who missed this memo? Uh, every single one of the apostles. Peter, who was crucified, upside down. Andrew, also crucified. Matthew, impaled on the ground and then beheaded. Bartholomew flayed to death. If you don't know what that is, don't Google it. Philip impaled by iron hooks in his ankles and hung upside down till he died. James was beheaded. Matthias was stoned and then beheaded. John was boiled alive, didn't die, so they exiled him to like a rock to live out his life. Uh, the other James, thrown from the top of a temple, didn't die, beaten to death. Uh, Jesus' brother James survived being thrown down a 30-meter cliff and then beaten to death with clubs. Paul, as we know, who was beaten and stoned and shipwrecked and jailed and rioted against and left for dead uh, and most likely, church history tells us, beheaded as well. Uh, all of these guys are the ones writing scripture or the, the ones that uh, Acts tells us that the early Christians and likewise we dedicate ourselves to the apostles' teaching. That's, that is a mark of being a Christian. A uh, mark of the, the true gospel, dedicating yourselves to the apostles' teaching. <clears throat> All of them, I mean, I should say the other way, none of them enjoyed, inverted commas, material health and wealth like the false, deadly, ruinous uh, prosperity gospel would say. It's just, it's, it is false, it's fake, it's ruinous. I mean, surely the apostles should have just had more faith, Right? Sure, they travel around with Jesus, wrote the New Testament, uh, but their lack of a victorious life shows their lack of faith. No, that's ridiculous. You know it's ridiculous. At the very best, like the most generous reading, the prosperity gospel is an over-realized eschatology because God does promise us health in our resurrected bodies. He does promise 
us comfort in his Holy Spirit and in his presence. But his words have been twisted and over-realized to apply to today in a way that Jesus and the apostles never meant for them to do. In reality, it's a, it's a, it's a sham, it's a scam, uh, it's voluntary slavery, actually. It's guaranteed ruin with the promise of everything and the delivery of nothing. Now, the antidote to prosperity preaching isn't poverty preaching. It's not, well, if health and wealth uh, guaranteed in this life uh, are false, and that's a false gospel, and the reason people leave the church and the faith, then obviously the antidote must be to preach poverty and sickness. No, no, that's not. (laughs) We don't swing the pendulum away from falsehood. We swing it towards the truth of the gospel. And so um, the, the... yeah, we don't want to go, well, this is excess and foolishness, so let's swing to another excessive foolishness at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, we don't always, always go to Jesus, always go to the gospel. Uh, Nicholas McDonald said, the truly good news is this, Jesus' dreams for us are weightier than the pursuit of health, wealth, and personal success. Jesus doesn't offer self-esteem. He offers the esteem of God, when we give up self-estimation. I love that. I love how Paul writes, I don't care what you guys think about me. I don't even care what I think about me. I care what God says about me. I love that. That's like one of my life verses. It's my own paraphrase, but that's what it says. Uh, He doesn't offer positivity. He offers God's profound comfort when we're brokenhearted by sin. He doesn't offer the nicest house in the neighborhood. He offers hope in the resurrection when we forego personal power. He doesn't offer supernatural favor from others, but instead offers God's eternal favor when we're despised on his account. In short, McDonald says, Jesus is a better God, a weightier God. He's not a huckster standing on the top of a pile promising us worldly wealth. He's a God who climbs down to the bottom of the pyramid, lays himself flat in the dust, and stretches out his arms at the cross where health, wealth, and abundance are nowhere in sight and offers us his riches, not the world's riches. Ephesians tells us his riches are unimaginable to us. We're too easily satisfied by the riches of the world. We're not, we should have a... a greater threshold for satisfaction than the world can give us. Because we're not made for the world. Uh, God truly, in Christ, truly satisfies in a way that health and wealth will always and invariably ultimately let you down. Because even if you, even if you live your life uh, sickness-free, you will eventually die. Even if you accumulate a lot of material success and wealth, you will eventually die. The promises of God